Welcome to The State of Us. Beyond mainstream cable news and party lines, with a millennial and a boomer, The State of Us pushes past the noise and uncovers all the issues that matter. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. Charter schools, a yes or a no? Well, it's a question that the country seems divided on, and there's a good reason for it. The answer, over many studies, is basically, sometimes charter schools work. It depends, and obviously that's not the type of stuff that makes awesome headlines. So the two opinion pieces we have today that we'll look at are, uh, one is from a public school teacher who claims that too many teachers oppose charter schools because they're bad for unions, not kids. We're going to examine that claim and talk about charter schools holistically. And in the same vein, and this is about what's best for kids, we're going to talk about teachers who are ready to come back to school. They want to come back, right? They want to get back in the classroom. Is that the best thing for students? Uh, The answers to both of these are not necessarily what they seem. And of course, that's why we're talking about them. But any conversation on education, charter schools, and the entire public school system simply could not be complete without. True Chat senior historian and an educator of more than 30 years. Here is your friendly redneck liberal. Lance Jackson. Well, I'm always excited to talk about education because I think it is the backbone of the American society as we know it and as as I think we want it. But our word for the day, doing our own little education piece here, is pertinacious. Pertinacious. It's an adjective. It is four syllables, P-E-R-T-I-N-A-C-I-O-U-S. And it means holding firmly to some purpose, belief, or action, often stubbornly or obstinately. So I think that goes with my feelings towards charter schools and a lot of teachers' feelings towards charter schools, is that we have this pertinacious idea that we we, we hold to these things stubbornly and we're not looking at them. And I think we do that with education as a whole. And I think politicians do it because they want to then pit one school against the other. And that's not what education is all about. So pertinacious, don't hold on to that belief uh, just stubbornly or obstinately, but take a look at things objectively and make your decision based on that. So Hold yours truly to that. Send us an email, podcast at thestateofus.org, and you know, see whether or not that I'm as open-minded as I try to be here. I mean, this is something we actually had a guest on, I think about a year ago now, um, who runs one of the D.C. public charter schools. Uh, and she made a lot of good points. Uh, you know, we had the topic itself was actually sort of about charter schools, but also about uh, unconscious bias in schools. And that's actually one of the areas that one of the reasons there's a lot of controversy over charter schools is they don't work well in all situations. And I think that's part of what makes it hard. But the same could be said about traditional public schools. They don't work well in all situations. And that's why this debate, unfortunately, is bogged down uh, so often in you're either for or against. And I think one of the great things that uh, the article that Lance had picked out, which was this basically this public school teacher uh, who was a union president for a while uh, and now works for charter schools, is basically saying it doesn't have to be a binary choice. We try to make it a binary choice, and it ought to be more about what works best in each situation. But for people that don't know, let's start some with the basics, because you might be sitting out there thinking, I've heard about charter schools a lot. I'm not 100% sure where I'm at on them, you know, but I may have a leaning. I'm not sure a lot of people understand, Lance, what a charter school is. And to be clear, um, the biggest difference, okay, between a charter school and a public school is basically one of flexibility. Charter schools are run by a private board, right, who's not necessarily elected by the people uh, the way that many public school boards are. And public schools are run essentially by the state board of education, right? That's who they report to. Um, So there's a whole line of standards that they have to meet and requirements that they have to to abide by. Um, And those are really fundamentally at the core of the difference because you might say, well, isn't a charter school a private school? Nope. Every charter school in the United States of America is a public school, every single one. Now, the other area that is different is that Unlike a public school, 
And there are certain circumstances where I guess public schools don't technically have to take everybody. Most charter schools use some form of lottery. In other words, they have a limited number of spaces. You apply. And in many cases, it's not always true, but there is a random selection of people that are allow- end up being allowed to attend. In other words, if demand is greater than what the school wants to take on, they're not required the way that a public school is to meet said demand. Um, and that's another one of the areas that can be an item of contention. Um, so, But it is important to note that it's kind of a misnomer to say, what's the difference between a charter school and a public school? Well, they're both public schools. The, the better question is, what's different, the difference between a charter school and a traditional public school? Um, because really, again, a charter school is, in fact, um, a public school. It's run with public dollars, um, and it is, generally speaking, open to the public. Um, so, Lance, we have that basis of understanding. Over the years, though, what do you hear from teachers that are the biggest objections? Well, the the problem is for most public school teachers is that charter schools don't operate by the same rules. They are they are given right of ways or leniency by the state board of education to do and try things that public schools are not. So therefore, when you go to compare, it's like, well, we're not allowed to do that. We don't get to choose our students. They just come into us. We don't get to we have to work within these parameters and the state school board said that the charter schools don't have to work under those parameters. So it, those are the, the biggest complaints um, that I think it has because unfortunately our politicians set this up as a way for competition because the idea was, well, if we get schools to compete against one another, then that will end up with a better product because that's the way the market works. That's the way capitalism works. Well, the gentleman who, the education scholar, Ray Buddy, who came up with the idea of charter schools in 1988, I've read his book. I've, this is something that I've been, you know, interested in since I started teaching back in 1984. In his book, uh, Education by Charter, Restructuring School Districts in 1988, his vision was to imagine a way that we could transform an entire district. He did not want schools to compete in the marketplace, pivoting to keep up with the rival down the block. He said schools don't work that way because they involve a constrained set of resources and the magical unpredictability of children. So we've taken a good idea and bastardized it into this political idea of, well, we're going to make you compete against the charter school and whichever one does better based on standardized testing, then that's where the state dollars are going to go to. And that wasn't the idea of charter schools. So I guess that's where my big complaint is. But when you talk about most teachers, it's because... Well, we're not playing under the same set of rules and we're not getting the same set of students. And the the variable here is the students, you know, and we, we argue as educators that if someone is choosing a school, then that means there's already a level of parental involvement that doesn't generally happen in a public school because it's very hard these days to get parents involved in the school. Um, that's one thing that at least with the pandemic has started to happen. Whether I agree with what parents have to say, they've gotten more involved in their children's education because of the pandemic. Whether it's, we want masks, we want a chance to learn in person, or we want a chance to learn at home, or we don't want masks or, or whatever it on one level for me has been a feel good to see parents finally getting involved in their child's education. The other thing is, is that charter schools vary so greatly because if you've got a new idea, you can open up a charter school. And so one charter school isn't necessarily the same as the the charter school across town because one might be based on math and science and the other one, let's say is based on the arts. So it's two different charter schools with two different focuses, with two different approaches, yet we refer to them, well, these are charter schools. 
And then we look at their results saying they're charter schools, but they're really not even the same school. Then you have your traditional public school in the same city. So you actually have three different choices of public schools before you even get into the private education or the homeschooling option. Well, and that's like we talked about at the beginning, the whole, the original concept behind charter schools was to allow a flexibility that public schools don't have in an effort to meet the needs of areas that don't fit the cookie cutter scenario, right? But the important note is that as a public school option, right? That's I think sometimes part of what happens is, and this is the politicizing of it, right, is that we lump private schools and charter schools together and they are very different entities. The similarity they have is the level of flexibility that they're afforded. The difference is that the private school, right, is primarily funded through private means. The public school is your taxpayer dollars. And generally speaking, they're pretty much all required to obtain some kind of standard method of randomly allocating their number of slots to students so that there's not the same discretion that a private school has in saying, we like you and we don't like you. Most of them follow some kind of random selection of their student body. Um, And most of them, unlike private schools, most of them are focused in areas where public schools have either failed, you know, altogether or are not doing a good job. Well, it's also a random selection of students who have applied. Exactly. And, I, and that's a huge word yes. because that takes a, and that, that's what I was referring to. The level to, of involvement. Right. The level of parental involvement, you know, and, and, and if you're a homeless child, because again, we don't want to talk about that in America, but there are children who are homeless. Well, you can't apply for a charter school because you have to have an address. And you say, well, you're being picky. Well, but that's, this is not a cookie cutter solution like our politicians want to make it. And we haven't even gotten into race to the top or no child left behind, which were federal standards that everybody was forced to meet. And if you didn't, then things were going to happen to you. And it didn't matter if you were a public school, a private school, or a charter school. And I'm sorry, but I'm into that format that you were trying to erase. But charter schools and public schools, in my mind, are two different entities because they play under two different sets of rules, even though they're both public in that they get state dollars. But they don't always get state dollars because if I'm a billionaire, I can I can apply to the state to run a charter school. Well, and that's the, I think the other important thing to understand, we'll talk about this a little more, is the charter school was almost an answer to bridging a divide between public and private schools, right? Bring What sometimes we have a hard time admitting some of the benefits of private school, which is a flexibility in the structure of education, um, but eliminate some of the very common complaints, which is the most notably that not everybody can go to a private school because, you know, you can't uh, if you can't afford it, generally speaking, you can't go. And generally, charter schools are different than that, that if you apply and if you get a spot, It's your your cost scenario is not different than it would be as if you had gone to a public school. And I think that's where and again, this is the whole reason that it's that from a political standpoint, uh, you know, we like to lump. We like to say, well, if you're for private schools, you're probably for charter schools, you're for charter schools, you're probably for private schools. And it's like, well, you know, really, there are three separate things that we got going on here. And I think we would all do well to better understand it. And that's why we're talking about it, because that's what we do on this show. Um, But we're going to look at a little bit more um, some of the details that were shared in one of the articles that we have linked at thestateofus.org about the the nuanced situations of where do they work really well, right? And where maybe should they be avoided um, and how might they be improved? Because again, the other article, which is also linked at thestateofus.org, points out that it's it shouldn't be just a binary choice on this. We really have to take a more holistic approach. But to find out what the answer on charter schools is, keep it here on The State of Us. We'll be right back. We are The State of Us. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. You've got a public school teacher of some 30 plus, 35 plus years on this program. 
Uh, so a traditional public school teacher. Um, and I think that the, the point is that it doesn't have to be all or nothing. And, and the interesting thing is when you hear public school teachers who are reflecting, uh, particularly this one article, Lance Wright is pointing out that sometimes the decision is not necessarily be, being made on what's the best option for the student. Um, sometimes it's being made more on uh, what's the best option to protect teachers on the whole. Um, and he doesn't really go into, I wish that he did, the explanation of how he thinks unions and charter schools could coexist peacefully. Um, but th- he brings up some interesting points, right? Like, for example, that since, at least to my knowledge, every public school has a teacher's union, sometimes unions make decisions to protect teachers who ought to be fired. I mean, you've said this before on the show. Or they have fought for rules which then make it very difficult to remove bad teachers, even though the intention of the rule may very well have been to protect good teachers. Um, And I think that's where, and that's honestly a big part of where the consternation over charter schools comes in, right? Is this fundamental question of how easy should it be to get rid of a teacher versus how difficult. Um, So you have a kind of different perspective on this because you're all for keeping good teachers, but you're also all for getting rid of the bad ones, right? Yes. (laughs) Well, you know, the old Uh, I think it was Michael Jackson. One bad apple don't spoil the whole bunch. Or was that the Osmonds? I'm I'm sorry. I'm getting old here. But uh, (laughs) I think I'll have to look. I'll look look that one up up for me. When you had said it at first, I'm like, yeah, that's Michael Jackson. But I I think Um, you're right. Yeah. I think back in the Jackson five days, one bad apple don't spoil the whole bunch, girl. Um, But the, the point is, is that in education, Unfortunately, we hear about the, oh, te- the Osmonds. It was the Osmonds. See, yep. I was right. My second one. We, <laughs> we hear the negative side from teachers so much on the in the news, and that hurts the rest of us because then, oh, all teachers are you know doing this or making these phone calls or taking these pictures or doing this kind of stuff, and then we all get put under the microscope, and it, it affects our um, how good we can be in the classroom, what we can accomplish. But from that end. It's we don't want people who aren't aren't good, but by the same token, we want to protect the people who are being different because sometimes if you're different and you're getting results, people believe it or not, can get jealous of teachers. Well, you're effective, and I'm not. Well, that's not right, and then they come after you because you're different or because you are effective. Hence, I believe in the union, but I've always told administration, that you have the power to get rid of bad teachers. All I'm going to do as the union is make sure that you follow the rules that are established. And administrators don't want that. It's like, we all know this person is bad. Let's just get rid of them. No, follow the rules to get rid of them. You don't follow the rules, then you're forcing my hand. But I have, I would argue then I have to follow the rules because then it forces you to follow the rules with the good teachers that you personally don't like. And you know how I, you know, my standing with administrators. Many times they didn't like me personally, but they liked what I did in the classroom with the students because I got the students to perform very well and make the administration look good. So they were constantly battling, God, I hate that Jackson guy. He's such a pain in my side, but he's so good for my kids. And luckily, the administrators I worked for let the fact that I was good for the students win out. But not all administrators do that. If you don't get along with them, they get rid of you. They don't care whether or not. That's where that human component comes in. The other bad side is, is that, okay, sounds like if you're listening, Jackson ought to go to a charter school because he'd have freedom to do what he wants. Problem is pay is not commiserate. The pay in charter schools is not as good. My brother teaches at a charter school and he loves it. And he's got the freedom to do things and to do things with his students and to open their minds. And he makes about half of what a public school teacher does in the major city where he works. Which is your big difference in the existence of unions versus not having unions. I mean, he has to work two other jobs 
to take care of his family because his teaching job doesn't pay. And if you say, well, don't you teach because you love the kids? It's not about the money. Okay, but I still have to provide for my family. And he works two other part-time jobs along with his teaching job because he teaches in a charter school that makes ha- where he makes half the money that he would make in a traditional public school. So there is that standard of living that you're trying to achieve for your family as well. So there's a lot there, you know, and I, I don't know how you want to unpackage all of that that I just said, but there, there's a lot of consternation because I look at the charter schools and it's like, yeah, I would love to have a chance to do that. But then, well, but you're not going to pay me a livable salary. And it's the same thing when you talk about private school. Private school teachers that I know, my friends who teach in private schools, they love the fact that they've got a lot of parental support, that their students are pretty serious about their studies, but they don't make anything. You know, because the pay is based upon how much they charge in tuition. And if the tuition goes too high, then there are no students in their class and they can't teach. So to me, the big thing here, and this is in an article from the New York Times, can we stop fighting about charter schools is what is this question? And it just to me wraps everything up here. What if as a society we pursued the dream of great schools not through punishment as no child left behind and not through competition as with the race to the top, but with the provision of essential resources to all. What if that was our focus? Well, it sounds so sensible. Like wouldn't, isn't that already our focus? And the answer is no. We, we give lip service to it. But the reality is, in my opinion of almost 40 years in the public education system, it is not. And that's the bad thing. That, and, and it hurts children. And we say we're for the children. And that's, that's what frustrates me. Because I will be the first to admit, not all children learn the same. And we, we try the cookie cutter approach in the traditional public school, and that doesn't work. So we try something different in the charter school. Well, it works for this set of students. Well, then we have the private school. Well, that works for this set of students. Then there's the online version, which does work for a certain set of students. And then there's the homeschooling piece that does work for some set of students. But yet the politicians want to find that one way that works for everybody. My degree is a Bachelor of Arts. Most educators today graduate with a Bachelor's of Science. Mm. And you say, Mm. and I'll just leave you with that and you can come back Mm. to it, but I'm done. I wrap up with that. (laughs) Oh, and what happened, Lance, to the great old days of respecting that science and art uh, can coexist and, in fact, strengthen one another? Because too often, like many other things, there's this binary belief that it has to be one or the other. And I think that it, it it's easy to say that in some cases, certain things that we do in education – tend much more toward a scientific approach. At the same time, I think that if you find any self-respecting teacher that's done it for a while, they would readily admit that not all students learn the same way. And and therefore, there is an art and understanding that you might come to um, that uses your own personal skills, right, as a teacher to interact effectively with students who don't learn the same way as others. And one of the common refrains that I think has to be put to bed is this notion that, well, by customizing education, you're inadvertently teaching students that the world shapes to them. No, you're teaching them that you can't do every career, right, as effectively as some others. And if you understand how you learn, you're probably going to do a better job at picking a job that meets your strengths rather than trying to fit you into a job that you can't, that you're never going to do as well as somebody else who has a skill set that is more directly agreeable to that job. And I think, and, but again, that's a nuanced answer. It requires explanation. It's not a sexy soundbite, right? Exactly. And, And that's why we don't do it because it's much easier to say, you know, well, you know, education should be a science or education should be an art or, you know, it, those things are quick, fast, simple. You, we should have charter schools. We shouldn't have charter schools, right? Those are easy things. And we know, I mean, listeners to this show know that 
America lately has been plagued by seeking easy answers, right? Um, and I just, I was looking at some quotes, Lance, because and I couldn't find the one that I wanted. I've, um, I read some great stuff about education recently, and I've got two different quotes for you um, that I think are summing up the situation well when we think about what what should the priority be, right? Laws for liberal education of youth, especially the lower class of people, are so extremely wise and useful that to a humane and generous mind, no expense for this purpose would be thought extravagant. And to continue, the whole people must take upon themselves the, the education of the whole people and must be willing to bear the expenses of it. There should not be a district of one mile square without a school in it, not founded by a charitable individual, but maintained at the expense of the people themselves. They must be taught to reverence themselves instead of adoring their servants, generals, admirals, bishops, and statesmen. And therein lies the rub, correct? Because we all want what's best for our children. So if you are from a more affluent neighborhood, you can pay more, pass a higher tax levy, and provide more for your students. And just because you don't make as much money doesn't mean you don't want the best education for your child. You do, but you can't afford to pay the high taxes. So then you have to live somewhere else. And the way the public school system works, then your child doesn't get all of the advantages. And that's been declared unconstitutional, for example, in the state of Ohio, in the state of Kentucky, over 20 years ago. Who's, uh, who's your guess on the quotes? This should be easy. Well, I would say, I would like to think it was Horace Mann, but it was probably John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, or John Adams both times. John Adams both times. And the quote that I wanted, Lance, because I didn't know this, um, but I think it's very very insightful is I, one, I didn't know that the Massachusetts constitution is the oldest and longest functioning democratic constitution in the world. Fascinating. Um, and second, that the original constitution, um, which John Adams wrote himself, um, one of the longest sections was in fact, um, very revolutionary worldwide in that it, in the constitution, laid out the importance of public education um, and the separation of public education from private education. And that's where Horace Mann started, the father of public education, was from Massachusetts. So he grew up, I mean, he have, he had that basis from which to draw from to start the idea of public schools. And if you go to the Northwest Territory, of which Ohio was became a part of the United States from the Northwest Territory. The Northwest Territory, one of the parts of it said, there shall be a school district in every township, which is your one mile by one mile area, which is why if you drive around the rural areas in Ohio, you see all of the old school buildings. Because by law, our founding fathers believed in that so much that they said, there will be a school in a, you know one mile by one mile radius. I mean, they believed that. And that's what they did. So much so that it's written into the oldest functioning constitution of democracy. And I think that speaks to, right, this fundamental idea that public education and a well-functioning democracy go hand in hand. Uh, but we've talked about how teachers are human, right? <laughs> despite, that is so despite, true. Despite, despite what some people think, I guess I'm not sure why people think that they're not human, but um, they are human. And one of those areas that they're human in is not only this debate about charter schools, right? And are we doing what's best for students? But also when it comes to this idea that teachers are ready to get back in the classroom, right? We're ready to go. Are they? Is that what's best for students? Keep it here on The State of Us, and we'll be right back. We are The State of Us. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. COVID changed a lot of things for public education. Notably, one of the largest changes by far was forcing public education, traditional public schools, to come uh, head-to-head with online learning. 
And there's a lot of debate about the validity of online learning. Part of the reason that we're talking about this today, though, is I think you'll find, at least for me, and I'd uh, venture that you'll find this from Lance as well, that the notion that these are separately existing things, in other words, uh, either online learning is good or it's bad, is again, like what we've talked about earlier in the show, sort of a fallacy in that it's not a perfect answer, okay? Is online learning the best option for most students? Probably not. But at the same time, it's difficult to answer that partly because we haven't done it long enough and had enough innovation in it to determine whether or not it's effective. And what you're seeing is, unfortunately, a lot of states that are going hard one way or hard the other. And for example, in Ohio, our state legislature has gone so far as to make it very difficult, if not next to impossible, for public school districts in this upcoming school year to offer an online alternative. And if you look at students, there's a percentage of students that did better online than they did. Is it the majority? No, it's not. Okay, but that's this is another example of if we're going to abide by what we said in the first segment, right, this notion that let's do what's best for students, why does it have to be one or the other? Why can't it be that we admit that many students do best, if not most students, do best in person, and a lot of teachers do best that way, but for the ones that don't, that an online education is suited well to, why aren't we, i.e. traditional public schools, offering that as an option. Because there are online options out there for K-12 students. Exactly. And if they're not going to go to the traditional school, if they choose that and your local school district doesn't offer it, then those state dollars that you talked about in the first segment are now going to go to this national K-12 academy that is online. And so by not allowing the locals to provide that, you're not getting, your tax dollar ends up going somewhere else instead of being spent on the students in your local area where you're paying the taxes. I, it's just, and I I was thinking of this the other night, Justin, I was watching TV and one of those mini commercials came on for college students who are working somewhere or are busy or and they want to advance their education, and here's our online school that you can apply to. Why are we promoting? There's so much promotion of online schooling for post-secondary schools. But then we say, oh, it's horrible that students can't learn that way if it's K-12. Is it because it's just different and we don't know? Or is it, is there a maturity level? You know, I, I don't know, but I think what we're doing is we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We're saying, well, it was the pandemic was just really, you know, the pandemic was hard for a lot of reasons. It wasn't necessarily because kids couldn't go back into the classroom. And then, then you say this, where as we're doing this show, on the day we're doing this show, it was in the news that in Florida, where the Delta virus is really running rampant right now, 400 students who went to public school this week are now under quarantine. So is it the best idea to go back? And I understand, and again, I'm, I'm doing the best I can. I'm not politicizing this, but if the best thing is for them to go back to school in public and now they're back home again and you have nothing for them, now they're not going to learn for 10 days or a week or two weeks, whatever the local county health board or school district has said they have to be quarantined. Now they're getting no learning. Whereas if you had an online option, they could still be getting some learning while they were being quarantined. I had to think through this before I was saying it because it was kind of going through my mind as you were talking and I wanted to make sure I get it right. But I think this, one of the big objections, maybe the largest single objection that I've heard to online public schools is the lack of social engagement that the young people have. That part of what they learn at school, right, is not just the subjects. It's we're in a classroom, we're with other students, we have people that are older than us. How do we interact? How do we get along? How do we socialize? That's part of what they learn. One of the reasons that there's a struggle with that with online schools is most online schools are strictly online and they're at for example, the state level, like many of these online schools or online academies, which are the same thing, online public schools in the state of Ohio, they are statewide. 
Well, if I go, if I'm going to that school and I'm in a class with somebody from Cleveland and I'm in Cincinnati, for those of you that don't know Ohio geography, those are opposite ends of the state. You're talking about uh, what a f- like probably a five or six hour drive. It's about a four hour. Way. It's a four, a four hour, hour drive from because you can go straight down okay. seventy one. I had so this four, argument with my daughters. Four, it's a four hour drive. four hour drive, right? Uh, one way, so eight hours if I'm going round trip. It's probably unlikely. Then on even a monthly basis, maybe monthly, but definitely not a weekly basis, I'm going to go see that other student from my class, right? Where if I'm in a local public school, I see them every day. And what I'm getting at here is if states focused more on providing the backbone technological infrastructure for online academies rather than it staying privatized, then you could enable all of these local school districts to offer their online option, but also include in-person socialization opportunities or hybrid approaches. Certain classes that we know work better in person versus ones that don't need to be in person. But again, we're too cookie cutter too. you know, well, that you know, we'd have to think about that and we'd really have to analyze stuff. And, and oh my gosh, we might do something that's the best thing for the student. I guess my point is the approach we're taking right now continues to be that either or, right? Well, you go to online public school and it's statewide and you're not going to know anybody. And But it doesn't have to be that way. And the pandemic showed us that. Individual school districts can operate their own online academies. And if they do that, there's more opportunities to keep that student body connected, meet people in your local community, make those social connections that we know are important, and counteract some of the negatives while still keeping some of the positives of online learning. And the biggest thing is that option of which we hear all the time, right? Choice, choice in schools. Well, you're ha- we're in, we're creating choices that are going to be better for students, and, and supposedly that's what the school should be all about: is providing the best education. This conversation is not an easy one, though, Lance, right? But that's why we did it. That's right. And here at True Chat, we have a mission, and that is to educate people by providing honest, open, and respectful conversations. And I believe we have done that today. And I'm going to leave you with this, and this is a quote from an article, the New York Times article uh, for the for this show. And it says, the pandemic, if it taught us anything, it said that beyond education, schools provide food, shelter, mental health care, and a frontline defense against abuse and neglect. So as we talk about what we want in a school, we need to take all of those things into consideration. But as you're talking with your friends and you're bringing those stuff, those questions up and having that intelligent conversation with the people in your life, and they say, well, where are you getting all this information? Tell them about us. Tell them they can listen to us. They can find us on Spotify, Overcast, Stitcher, Apple Podcast, and everywhere podcasts are found. The State of Us can be heard Tuesdays and Thursdays by 4 a.m. Eastern Time as a podcast, and we're also a syndicated radio programs. On the weekends, check your local AM and FM station. See if they carry our program. If not, call them up and tell them they should. For the state of us on True Chat in Urbana, Ohio, I'm Justin T. Weller. I'm Lance Jackson. Special thanks to our producer, Bradley Butch, and thank you all, our audience, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Be the change. Be sure to check out our website, thestateofus.org, for books, articles, and all the ways to tune in. Thestateofus.org.